Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Midday Live from our studios here at Adesawe, Accra. My name is Martin Nasidu Dati. Coming up this afternoon, top of the story this afternoon, six pupils standing trial for the murder of their teacher at Isiakwa, remanded into prison custody. Diesel's coming up shortly. Seven persons arrested for illegally logging rosewood in the Volta region. And also, customers of investment firm Gold Coast. Uh, hit streets of Kumasi demanding their locked up funds. We have details of all these stories, including sports, business and international news all coming up shortly. Stay with us. All right, we start straight from the uh, education front. The executive director of the Ghana National Council of Private Schools is alleging that government's decision to license all private schools and teachers within the year 2020 as part of the roadmap to leadership Roadmap to teacher professionalism will lead to the collapse of 70% of private schools in the country. Per their assessment, 70% of low fee paying schools will hold up under the licensing policy owing to the fact that most private schools will not meet the criterion for the licensing. They argue that the policy, when implemented by 2020, will force private schools to employ licensed teachers whose salaries they cannot afford, coupled with the fact that the schools without license would not be permitted to operate, leading to the collapse of many of the schools. And this is a concern that they are raising. We want to uh, find out from uh, Peter Ante. He is the... Um, he is with the, the communications officer of the Conference of Heads of Private S Second Cycle Schools and uh, would want to find out from him. Let's go on to the phone lines now uh, to Skype, actually. Peter Anti is the Institute of Education Studies and uh, he's joined us on the Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon, Martin. Right, to start with, what do you make of government's roadmap to sanitize the system and uh, to make sure that it is justified? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, in 2008, we passed the Education Act, and one of the important things that the Education Act sought to do was to try to streamline the operations of private uh, educational institutions in the country. So if you look at the Good. Education Act, uh, Section 23, it's specifically dedicated to the uh, establishment of educational institutions in the country. If you permit me, let me read um, one or two things for us to understand where the ministry is coming from. So it says that a person or an institution may establish, manage, or operate a private education in accordance with the guidelines issued and regulations made in that behalf by the minister and in consultation with the Education Service Council or the National Accreditation Board. So. In the Education Act, no, no private education institution can be established unless it's in accordance with uh, 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 yeah, the regulations that have, been, that have been set out by the Ministry of Education and the Ghana Education Service or the Accreditation Board. So it is, right in, in, it is in, in the right direction that now the ministry would want to enforce this particular act and, and make sure that every private institution in the country is licensed accordingly. In fact, if you look at the act, it even tells you that their, their fees should be approved by the ministry. I think these are things that we have glossed over over the years, and, and it's time that we, 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 we abide strictly by the law. Uh, the private schools are arguing that um, it would put them out of business. Should that be reconsidered? Um, uh, basically, what they should be looking at is the interest of the, of the public. You know, because education is a public good. And that is why the setting of their fees even should be approved by the ministry or the Ghana Education Service. If they are interested in providing this public good, then the general uh, uh, well-being of the public should be, should be paramount here. And that is making sure that they are given the right kind of education, they have the right kind of resources, they have the right kind of uh, personnel who will deliver education. So... Putting them out of business should not be a, 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 an issue for now. I think they should cooperate with the ministry and the Ghana Education Service to get their standards right, to get the right teachers, to get the right resources and, and everything, so that the children that go to these private schools would also benefit accordingly as they, 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 they rightly have to. 
from, from, from them and not just because they are helping the government to deliver education, they can go about, do everything, anything that they want and still insist that... But Peter, that I, I, should we be concerned about timelines, um, considering the 2020, which is just next year, and to sanitize yeah. the education front, a lot needs to go into. Do you think it is too short a time to alert these schools? It might be, but the fact is that the Education Act was passed in 2008, uh, 2008, and that is almost 10 years and over. That is why we were even concerned about the delay in the implementation of the teacher licensing policy, which was also in the Educational Act. So, so it, 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 giving them one year to, to settle in might be a little bit short. But if you look at when the, uh, the Act was passed and when we, are, we want to implement it, we, we might want to share the blame. The ministry should take part. The Ghana Education Service should take part. And the private sector, uh, private education institutions should also take part. Maybe they can, they can present their issues to the ministry and they might want to extend the year uh, the, the year to maybe they should give them two to three years to to put their houses in order so that they can still uh, deliver education to our kids but we should also note that the more that they deliver the kind of education that we do not want as a society to our kids we cannot sit down and then watch uh, uh, w w without showing concern from, from where you sit as a consultant and someone who has been in the education front for a number of years how best do you think we can address this so the, the private schools do not feel done in? Now, the first thing that should be done is uh, there should be a lot of consultation. A lot of consultation. I, I hope the ministry would continue to engage the private, private uh, school owners. Now, uh, apart from that, we, we should also make sure that parents that are sending their awards to these schools are also well abreast with the changes that are going to be introduced in the system so that they can also enforce some of these things in the various private schools that they are, 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 are with. Again, the private schools themselves should now try to come together. I know they are already together, but then they should group themselves into classes so that those that are that consider themselves as low uh, uh, fee, pay, fee something something people that they say 70% are going to lose their job, they should come together and then find ways and means to standardize their activities so that they can present a, 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 a common front to the ministry when it comes to some of these negotiations. But the ultimate fact is that these private schools should try as much as possible to uh, 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 um, be in consultation constantly with the ministry and the Ghana Education Service so that they do not get out of of, 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 of job or of, of work as, as they are trying to trying to portray or they are trying to put across. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Peter Anti, for your thoughts. As always, Peter Anti is with the Institute for Education Studies and helping us understand really uh, what co these concerns being put forward by the private schools uh, in Ghana. Let's go to uh, in studio here now and speak with the uh, someone who at least has also a, a stakeholder position on this development. Uh, Chamber for is uh, the head of communications of the Conference of Heads of Private Second Cycle Schools. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon, my brother. Thank you for having uh, me. To start with, how are you bracing yourself up for this new directive from the uh, government? Uh, first of all, let's, let me establish that a statement that came out uh, claiming 70% of schools will collapse was from a different body. Uh, NACOPS or whatever body, but um, we are from your outfit. No, no, it's not from our outfit. Let me let me first establish that. Okay. No, we stand should take into account some very petty issues. One, what are we going to look at? What, what are we talking about? Are we really going to give a period, let's say within five years, all teachers in the private second, I mean private schools should really take this particular examination. What is really the content of this particular examination as well? Uh, are we also looking at sitting down with the, with the schools to look at which other avenues we can equally take into cognizance? The, the issue of experience here is very, very important. Are we not also going to wake up one day and they tell us that once you did not enroll yourself in an education kind of setup, you know, Hmm. Is also something we are going to look at. We feel most but of the what policies. Were, what, were the, what were the fundamentals of the agreement of setting up your association? 
before private schools started, was there like a blueprint that every private school that is to be set up must follow? Whether private or public, once you want to establish a new school, you are still supposed to go through the same processes that public schools go through. Okay. And it's as simple as that. Especially okay. even the secondary level, you are going through the tier one process where the, the, the regional educational office will come and inspect, national will come and inspect. So we believe that most of the policies of government are mostly in the interest of the Ghanaian, I mean the average Ghanaian. But the case we have is that sometimes the implementation process is what gives us some of these worries. Mm -hmm. If government had invited a, a, a major stakeholder like private senior high schools or even private schools to discuss this, of course, we would not, we would not raise qualms against a, a, such a policy. But we feel it is something we need to sit, discuss, let us know the details, and we are very ready to help. Have, and you, bring made, have you taken steps to engage government? We have just been told about this. We just said the, the announcement. Officially, government has even not in, invited Listen primary you. schools. You understand? Okay. This is where sometimes we have our worries. As if in, we, we, we really they recognize private schools as a major stakeholder, any time a policy of this nature is coming, private schools should be engaged, right. whether you like it or not. We have a chunk of students also with us that we are training for the, the, the development of this country. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it here for now. Certainly, uh, we'll be picking the thoughts of government to see what concrete actions it is that they are taking regarding these new policies uh, towards private uh, schools in the country. But thank you. Che Bafo is the head of communications for the Conference of Heads of Private Second Cycle Schools in the country. We stay on the education front because another developing story has to do with the six pupils that... Uh, beat up one of their teachers and killed him. So six people standing trial for the murder of their teacher at Esiakwa in the eastern region have been remanded into prison custody. The accused persons allegedly brutally assaulted their 55-year-old teacher who died shortly after he was sent to the hospital. The teens have been charged with conspiracy to murder and murder. Four of the suspects, Richard Anani, Emmanuel Mreku, Philip Okodie and Paul Boedu have been charged with conspiracy to commit murder and murder. 55-year-old teacher George Somua, a tree and religious and moral education teacher at the Asiakwa Salvation Army Basic School, Asiakwa, was assaulted by the accused persons on April 25 at Asiakwa and died on May 4 at the hospital. Lawyer for the accused persons, Peter Nimo, prayed the court to grant his client's bill, but the Kibi District Judge Alice Efuya Yurenchi remanded them in police custody to appear on June 25. Some teachers and members of the national leadership of the Ghana National Association of Teachers, NAT, were at the court to give their solidarity. Let's stay on this matter. Yvonne Nikwe has joined us uh, via phone. She was in court when this ruling was given. Yvonne, good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. What else can you tell us regarding the court proceedings? What were the arguments for and against? Was it a, a, a straightforward judgment that was given? Well, the court proceedings today were of emotions and tensing. At the end of the day, the plea of the suspects were not granted. Uh, lawyer Peter Nimako of K. Chambers was hoping that two of uh, the suspects would be granted bail, but the court did not take that. And so they would have to reappear on June 25th of uh, next month. I shall speak to you the national or the Ghana National Teachers Association have been having a press briefing where the teachers and residents for Isiaka, they are pleading with them to return to school to teach, especially the junior high school people who are in third year because the BC is just um, months away. But they are saying that uh, they are not psychologically prepared to teach the people again because of what has happened, especially when a number of them have been pinpointed by the suspects to be dealt with again. And so if the government or stakeholders does not provide them with adequate security in the school and their homes, they might not return to school. As you speak, for the past week when school is open, they have not been to school. Schools have been closed. And so for the two that they've been asked to be granted bail, 
Uh, is it something you think gov I mean, the, the courts are going to consider? Uh, for the, uh, the argument for their lawyer is that they were not present at where the incident happened. And so the person who gave their name did that uh, under uh, pension. And so but did he state when that next time will be when he appears uh, in court the next the date for the reappear is june 25th 2019 that is next month okay thank you very much Yvonne Nikwe, for your time she's our eastern regional correspondent with that update the Ghana Federation of Allied Health Professions uh, professionals is beginning a sit down strike from today over their exclusion from proposed teaching uh, hospital board. The federation made up of about 18 groups within the health sector is, uh, in a statement, is also pushing for, among other things, fairness and equity in the health sector regulatory and management environment in Ghana. Already, the group uh, has embarked on a series of actions, including the daily wearing of red armbands uh, to press home their demand, which, uh, according to them, is yet to be met. And um, Dr. Ignacio Wunimbonu is the chairman of the Ghana Federation of Allied Health Professions and joins me, uh, will be joining me in studio, well, has actually joined me in studio to help us understand really why they think that their concerns are not being met and what government has told them in the last few days since they started this protest. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me. Why do you think government is ignoring you but, uh, admit that as um, health sector one of the core values that underpins every health practice is teamwork mm. and that team where recognizes the role of every member of the team every team must have a jesse and a position to play and therefore if you fail to do that you're only making the team members ball boys Mm. What we are asking for is that we should be given a proper position and uh, a particular role to play. And by proper position, you mean you want to be part of the board? In fact, uh, if you talk of the health sector, if you talk of the clinical staff, uh, we have close to 22 core clinical staff, uh, aside medical doctors, aside nurses, aside psychologists, aside pharmacists. Mm -hmm. The rest of the 18, and I mean laboratory scientists, radiographers, optometrists, dietitians, nutritionists, orthotists and uh, uh, prosthetics, health information, medical physicists, the uh, uh, technical officers, public health, mental health officers, paradental associates, all these groupings, the rest of the 18 are uh, called allied health professionals mm. or professional bodies. And these have been excluded in the proposed uh, amendment that is before Parliament currently. Uh, in that particular amendment, individual experience in risk so clearly you have, you have and we have been excluded totally. Mm. Now, what is making it worse is that this should not have happened if we had a board, a governing board for our council, which for the past 29 months has not been in place. Uh, you know the critical role a board plays when it comes to the governance of mm. a particular... Uh, uh, have, you, have you engaged government at any level and what kind of feedback have they given you? In fact, since 2017, we have engaged government on this matter. We met the ministry. On the board, we have a representation of four. Mm -hmm. We met among the 18, selected our four, met the ministry, submitted officially in a letter form in a meeting, made a number of follow-ups on that particular issue. Along the line, we're told they have forwarded a list to the Council of uh, State for attention. We trusted the ministry. But our checks show that the list was only sent March this year, mm. which meant it was a deliberate ploy to keep the list at the ministry. And within that period, a number of key decisions were taken and it's seriously affecting the health sector. Let me uh, uh, just let you know, this has led to a high speed of quackery. A lot of unqualified people are attending to patients 
in uh, the, 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 the health sector. And this is very dangerous. It's like most of our drivers not having driving lances. Will you sit in the car without the driving mm. lances? That is a danger to society. And we as professionals see this particular thing. So you're starting... this period, mm -hmm. laws are being uh, uh, made and allies being made against us and trying to make us subservient to other professional groups. And we okay. are saying, no, you, you this are... must stop. The discrimination must stop. You're, so you started with a sit-down strike mm -hmm. yes. today. Yes. And then what next? And, so, and until when? In fact, it... It is going to be indefinite until somebody hears, either from the ministries, either from the, uh, the president. We have petitioned the president of this nation. And knowing that he's a listening president, we know he will call us as his children. And what what are your numbers? In fact, we, uh, I tell you, the laboratory alone is about 4,000 okay. across. That's if you good. add environmental health, so we are getting close to uh, another 15,000. If you want to add... Um, other groupies in physiotherapy, mm. in radiography, in orthotics, the numbers are huge, are huge and we should not be discounted. How can you exclude 18 members from a profession, uh, from uh, the health sector, and you have space for just three in the okay. board? This cannot be fair. Right. Uh, clearly, like we mentioned, it is uh, a developing story, and I will keep an eye on it and keep our viewers posted as well. But clearly, uh, the government watches TV3, so we are hoping to hear a response from them uh, in the coming days. Dr. Ignatius Awinimbono is the chairman of the Ghana Federation of Allied Health Professionals. Um, uh, he's been sharing their concern with us. This is Midday Live on TV3. Uh, on to some other stories this afternoon. Six people have been arrested in the Volta region for lumbering in uh, Rosewood illegally. The local Asafu group who teamed up with the police, the regional police command uh, patrol team, arrested the gang in the Kalakwa game reserve. Of the driver of an articulated truck with registration number GN3422-11 fully loaded with rosewood logs was also arrested, according to the Butia Development Union and members of various Asafo groups. There's been a massive timber exploitation, particularly the rosewood species in the Kalakba Game Reserve. The executives of the Butia Development Union said their independent investigations confirmed that there's a cartel involving state officials behind the exploitation of timber in the forest reserve. This is still Midday Live on TV3 and uh, you can also get interactive with us. Let us know what your thoughts are on the stories we are bringing to you this afternoon, uh, including the, the, that from the Education Front and the Health Front. On MTN Video Reporter right now, our citizen journalist Enoch Echampong highlights an erosion along a road causing a deep pit at Ekima uh, in the Ashanti region. A Pramodo bridge is in bad condition. So the highways and the district chief executive to go on board and check the bridge. The bridge has spawned for almost two to three years. No one is mine. The highway that are responsible for is a Pramodo barrier is in bad condition. Eh? The regional minister to need to come on board and do something about it. So that's actually a bridge. It was a, a, a bridge, and that is a very dangerous hole developing there. The earlier it is rectified, the better. You can also let us know what your thoughts are, and then when you have any video report, do send us uh, on our WhatsApp number 055 143 3044. 055 143 3044. We'll be back shortly. Let's do some business now. And scores of customers of gold fund management in the Ashanti region have embarked on a demonstration to protest what they are uh, to protect against their locked-up investment. The disgruntled investors claim fund managers have denied them access to their funds for close to a year now, and they want government to assist them recover their funds. Our Ashanti regional correspondent Ibrahim Abubakar joins us for an update. 
Commerce of Investment Firm, Gold Coast Management Fund, have hit the street of Kumasi to demand the release of their locked up fund. The angry customers say they are losing patience with the way fund management have handled them as they struggle to access their funds. They claim to have been denied access to their funds for close to a year. The disturbed investors will be marching through some principal street of Kumasi before they finally present their petition to the Ashanti Regional Minister. I will be engaging with some of them. Yes, what I'm saying is that we need our money now. Ekufuado should come to the plead of the, the customers. The customers really suffering. Apart from how we see even if he doesn't have the interest, he should take the interest and bring our principal. That's what we are looking for. And we are pleading on Okufuado, SEC, BOG, they should come. We also should invite him today. Immediately we finish with this demonstration. The government must also pay him all his debt so that we know that the government doesn't own him anything so that he can refund our money to us. So what, what's next after this demonstration? After this demonstration, if he, he doesn't pay the money or the government doesn't come in, we are marching to the flag house. Why this action today? Um, in fact, what is going on is very sad. You can imagine uh, Nane Kufuado and his MPP. It appears as if they were encouraging persons with disabilities to stop, to stop begging and work with their hands and minds. Unfortunately, I and my wife, both visually impaired, have invested a whooping 105,890 with them, with the view of roofing our building. We finished with our building since June last year. I've requested for this money to roof it, but to no avail. When you go there, they will tell you Parkwesi is developing a plan. They can't decide for me what I should do. I invested with them for a period that I will take my money and I, 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 I use it for the purpose that I saved. What is Parkwesi in Doom, Bank of Ghana, and the Securities and Exchange doing to us? Ghanaians are really suffering. There are retirees, uh, sick persons, persons with uh, the, all sorts of vulnerability, and we have taken our money. God is watching the hypocrisy. I'm demanding for my money and nothing more, nothing less. The disgruntled customers are appealing to the government to assist them get back their investment. The firm has currently shut down its Kumasi office to avoid attacks on its staff by some angry customers. We will keep you updated in our subsequent bulletins. Ibrahim Abubakar, TV3, Kumasi. Uh, the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASEP, has asked government to abrogate contracts of 12 inactive petroleum companies to ensure oil production does not decline. The Director of Operations and Resource Mobilization at ASEP, Ben Boache, said that 12 companies are non-performing non and causing the country to lose. The framework for managing the petroleum industry in Ghana before the discovery of oil was established and given legal backing by two main statutes, BNDC Law 64 and the Petroleum Exploration and the Production Law 84. The African Center for Energy Policy, ASAP, says out of 15 companies, just three are active, while 12 companies have failed to live up to the requirements of their contracts. If you bring in capable companies, they will be able to operate the field and drill and discover oil. So simply, the situation we are faced with is that the companies who are giving excuses haven't really shown capacity to exploit the blocks. None of the remaining 12 companies have fulfilled its minimum obligations within the initial exploration period and no discoveries have been made. The center questioned government's slow response to ending these contracts. If you look at the caliber of companies that are showing interest in the competitive approach, that also proves our point that the companies who are sitting on our blocks and not working are simply incapable. So that is good for Ghana to ensure that we have competent companies that can actually do the business of exploring uh, for oil. 
Director of Operations and Resource Mobilization at ASEP, Ben Boache, added, Since the country's oil is finite in about 20 years, without new discoveries, production will decline. He also stressed to scrutinize the blocks given to GNPC to ensure partners are selected by fair means to increase investor confidence in the sector. Government statistician Professor Samuel Kobina Enim says policy intervention should not only be targeted at the short term but made relevant in the long term. He made the statement in Accra at a conference on policy interventions to reduce the burden of unpaid activities. Unpaid activities as unpaid economics of policy intervention to reduce unpaid activities had Ghana and Tanzania as case study. The study conducted by the Levy Economic Institute showed the impact of fiscal and social infrastructure expenditures on time and consumption poverty are clear for both Ghana and Tanzania. Government statistician Professor Samuel Kwabna Enim suggested a lifetime relevance of policy interventions aimed at addressing time use and burden on unpaid activities. As scholars, as policy makers, as data producers, once we're thinking about policies, we just don't have to think about the immediate benefits of the policy now. The key question is that, can we sustain the policy relevance through time? And if we can sustain it through time, how do we link it to the cutoff or its perpetual? Or forever we're going to see that this will lead to B and that will lead to C so that at the end of the day there will be some form of convergence. He indicated the need for interrelationship between micro and macro levels. At the end of the day, are we able to come out clear in terms of the past two effects from the micro level to the macro level and sequencing in terms of what I said earlier on, whether micro should precede macro or macro should precede. Once we lose out of these conversations, we tend to operate in boxes and at the end of the day, it doesn't have the relevant policy impact. Okay. A senior scholar and director of distribution of income and wealth program at the Levy Economic Institute of Bad, Ajit Zacharias, noted poverty rate is enhanced by time use and unpaid activities in both Ghana and Tanzania. What that means is that for a relatively large number of working families, relative that is to the number of officially poor households, they manage to stay above the official poverty line by actually putting in long hours at the job at the expense of providing the minimum needed care for themselves and their dependents. That's actually the meaning of that, what we call the hidden poverty rate. The coordinator for the time survey, Benis Sewa Ofusubu, the need for If social and fiscal infrastructures are put in place, then unpaid work of women will reduce. For if there are roads that are in good conditions, if there are provision of water supply, it will limit the time that the women will spend in walking that distance or wasting much time in fetching water to reduce time spent on unpaid work. So that's it for Business on Midday Live on... Let's go to the northern part of the country now. And Mohamed Bundurubum, the journalist who stood surety for Helena Huang, has been put behind bars after he failed to meet the bail bond put on him by the Tamale Circuit Court. When the news team visited him at the Sakasaka police station in Tamale around 7 uh, this morning, he said he is yet to get bail. He indicated he called five people yesterday to bail him but they all could not meet the surety of the 3,000 Ghana City monthly bond. Though he is yet to get someone to bail him, he says he is sure of getting Helena Huang when he gets bail. He mentioned he has information where, about Helena Huang and also added that he regrets involving himself in the Helena Huang Rosewood case. He was optimistic he will get Helena Huang to the police after he is released. <laughs>
All right, so uh, coming this weekend, all are geared up for the Ghana Music Awards, but it's now the Vodafone Music Awards. So the 20th Vodafone Ghana Music Awards is just a few days away. Any idea of which musicians have won? Article of the Vodafone Ghana Music Awards since the beginning. Watch this. The prestigious Ghana Music Awards has for 18 years been celebrating outstanding Ghanaian musicians. The award has always left in its trail varied sentiments. While losers are left disappointed, it is all bliss for the big winners on any VGMA night. 2000, Daddy Lumba. Born Charles Kojofusu, a.k.a. Daddy Lumba, the singer won Artist of the Year at the Maiden Ghana Music Awards, held in the year 2000. Released in 1998, DL's mega hit, Abinwaha, did the magic for the hitmaker. Patronage of the song soared thanks to speculations that Abinwaha had then been banned by the National Commission on Culture for its explicit content. Curious to know the content? Music lovers grabbed copies of the cassette, making it an instant hit. 2001, Kojo Entry. Born Julius Kojo Entry, Afro-pop high-life and reggae musician, Kojo Entry, also known as Music Maestro, succeeded Lumba, winning the 2001 awards. Celebrated for his vocal prowess, Kojo Entry still remains relevant after over three decades of gracing the music scenes. <laughs> Other top VGMA winners include 2002. Rapper Lord Kenya won the topmost honors in the year. Lord Kenya, now an evangelist, won the competition ahead of his bitterest rival, Obrafo. 2003, Conti Hene. 2004, VIP. Two thousand and five, Bice Osei aka Obo. Two thousand and six, a Forian Two thousand and seven, Samini. Two thousand and eight. Kwa Kese. Kiss. Head knock it. Head knock it. Uh -huh. You know the quality of the feeling. Oh. 2009. Ochiame Kwame. 2010. Sarko Dier. You know what time it is. Sometimes when I sit down to reminisce. I've got the thing with me to do. Girl, give me a kiss. Now we got more things to do. This is the genesis. I'll be feeling it. 2011. After seven years, VIP came back much stronger to win the Artist of the Year for the second time in 2011. Reggie Rockstone replacing rapper Promzy. 2012, rapper Sarkodie won the awards for the second time in 2012. 2013 R2Bs, the Tema based duo comprising Moogies and Payday, now Omar Sterling, released three back to back hits Walai, Odo, and Bela Trap to win big. 2014 Shatawale. Two thousand and fifteen, Stone Boy. Twenty 
2016 EL. Money, honey, hey, well, and I can't be my call. 2017, Joe Matthews. So 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 and in 2018, Ebony Reigns. And the artist of the year is Posthumous Award to Ebony. Heba. The late dance hall songstress and hitmaker Ebony Reigns made history, winning the VGMA's topmost award, Artist of the Year, posthumously. She became the first female musician to grab the Artist of the Year since the inception of the awards in 2000. Ebony is remembered for songs like Ponza, Date Your Father, Ma Miche, and Hustle, aka Dimija. <laughs> The battles have been drawn. Joe Matto, Sakodie, Stoneboy, Shatawale, Kwame Eugene, and Kim Promise are in the race for the Artist of the Year. Who wins the topmost category? Well, only time will tell. An artist of the year goes to, it will be announced on Saturday. Do make a date to the Ghana Voter for Music Awards. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Martin Esiridati. There is more news on our website, 3news.com. Do have a good afternoon as always. Stay positive. Bye for now.